Moving right along. All right, well, I guess I'm up then. Uh, so let me share my screen. Uh, so we're moving on to uh, essentially the keep for that, uh, that latch, that barb um, that you see in this photo here. Uh, let's talk about what this uh, involves. Uh, so our task at hand is to forge a tenon staple. That's a staple with a tenon on each end uh, to dimension and we're given the dimensions. Those are available online uh, and then attach those to a backing plate. And again, um, the dimensions for that are available online, right? So we made it this far. Uh, so this should be easy, right? So uh, this staple presents some unexpected challenges. So let's look at what those challenges are. Uh, so challenge number one is forging tenons on round bar. Uh, so in level one, uh, we learn to use uh, and we make the tools to uh, forge tenons at the anvil. Uh, and unfortunately, that uh, technique does not work well for these tenons. Um, they're small and they're on round bar. Uh, so that's challenge number one. Uh, challenge number two is the, that squared bend. Uh, the first bend is easy. Uh, you could do that over the edge of the anvil. You could do that over the vise, uh, but then what? Um, and I distinctly remember making my own um, gate latch some years ago and coming across that second bend and looking all over my shop for something that I could bend it over uh, and um, looking for a creative solution. So those are two uh, challenges that we need to resolve. Uh, so these are both tooling issues. They are not uh, skill issues. Uh, so let's look at the solutions. All right, so the first thing that we need to, to make a good tenon, uh, we need a guillotine tool. Um, and for those of you that are instructors, um, I recommend that have these available for your students. Um, we don't want uh, tooling to be a hurdle for passing level one. Um, so have these available. Um, so what you see here is a smush -o -matic. It's a guillotine tool specific to tenons and then two dies for making the tenons. And I'll get into how we use those in a minute. Uh, but the first step is to make that smush -o -matic. So let's look at the construction. If you have another type of guillotine, uh, you could make dies for that as well. Uh, the difference between uh, other guillotines and this one is that the dies on the smush matic are a little bit wider, so it accommodates a longer tenon, uh, but you can certainly work with another type of guillotine tool. Uh, so to make this, uh, what we need is one and a quarter inch uh, square tubing, um, and you can see that here. Um, and uh, when you're working with that tubing, it has a weld bead on the inside, uh, that weld bead you need to file out. Uh, you can uh, use a triangular file for that to get in there. It doesn't take too much time. Uh, the wall of this uh, should allow you to put in your dies. We're using one inch mild steel here. So you don't want it to be any thicker than an eighth of an inch. Uh, then we're using um, the uh, mild steel, uh, a, a one inch square bar for the dies. Um, and I just need to move my, uh, there we go. Okay. Um, so if you look over here, we have our dies. Um, and um, what we've done here is uh, uh, heavily round the edges so that it fits into our tubing uh, and tapered the end uh, to allow for mushrooming. Um, and uh, to construct this, uh, we take an inch of tubing here, uh, an inch of uh, two inches of tubing here, uh, and then a, a spacer uh, to go in the middle to help us with welding and weld it onto angle iron that fits into your hardy hull. The, the angle iron is convenient because it's easy to file to size. Uh, then on the bottom, we weld on a washer uh, that you see here. Uh, and the purpose of the washer is as we use the tool, uh, it creates scale uh, and scale gets stuck in, uh, that, in with that bottom die and sometimes that die can get stuck. So this allows us to put uh, something in there of our to poke that uh, bottom die back out. Um, uh, if you're using a washer, almost all washers are galvanized. So be sure to take that galvanization off. You can soak it in vinegar to do that. Um, 
uh, since our backing plate was an eighth of an inch, um, I had some eighth of an inch. Uh, so I drilled a hole in a piece of that instead of using the washer, but um, the washers are cheap. So that's easy to, to use that. Uh, for the dies themselves, uh, we want to cut a piece of a square bar. This bottom piece should be uh, this one inch plus about another inch. Uh, the one consideration is you want to make sure you can get that die out. So whatever uh, space you have here, you want it to be just slightly uh, smaller than this space. Uh, and then for this top um, piece, we need one, two, three, four, plus uh, about a fifth uh, inch uh, for uh, putting the taper on the end. Uh, so that's the construction for the smush matic All right, so, um, oops, sorry about that. Our next step is we need to make the, uh, the, the dies. And to create tenons, we, uh, we need to do two functions. The first is to butcher in the shoulder, uh, create that shoulder and isolate the material uh, that will then become our tenon. Uh, then we need to draw out that uh, isolated material to become, uh, that will be our tenon. Uh, so the, um, we have two butcher options here. The first one is the angled butcher, uh, where we cut our uh, square bar on an angle and then file in uh, the uh, size uh, that we need for our tenon. Uh, if you don't have the ability to cut bar on an angle, um, you can drill holes instead. Uh, we drill the hole to size your tenon, so here a quarter of an inch, uh, and then a clearance hole on the other side that goes almost all the way, leaving just enough to create our, um, uh, our shoulder and, and the root of our tenon there. Uh, and here this is sized to half an inch uh, because our bar is three-eighths of an inch, uh, and then you cut that in half. Uh, and for those of you that are instructors, um, this, uh, this drilled uh, die uh, works a little bit better in a student population uh, because we have more of a landing pad here where these two tools meet. Uh, this angled butcher did not uh, work well in the student population. It just distorted, these edges distorted, but it works great at home. Uh, then we need a top and bottom swage. Um, and so let me talk through how to make uh, these tools. I won't talk about how to make the drilled one. That's uh, pretty obvious. Um, okay, so our first step here is to um, taper the end to allow for mushrooming. And, um, uh, whoops, sorry about that. Um, so uh, we're doing that to allow for mushrooming, also to center our hammer blow as we use the tool. Uh, once we've done that, and keep in mind, we're working with two pieces here, even though I'm only showing one piece uh, in my photos, uh, we want to uh, make the two pieces identical uh, so that we have both uh, sides of our die. Uh, so our first step here is to file off um, about an eighth of an inch, maybe a little bit more of a landing pad where those two uh, dies will meet. Uh, and then with a triangular file, uh, find the center and start your cut. Uh, we're aiming here, uh, we've been told in our drawings that we need a quarter of an inch tenon. So we're aiming here for a quarter inch uh, opening. Um, so then we switch to a uh, round die um, and um, a quarter inch chainsaw file works really great for this. Uh, the chainsaw file has a consistent diameter. So you know that you're getting uh, that quarter of an inch. Uh, so um, that worked well here. Um, once you get it to the size that you want it to be, then uh, we want to take the corners off the edges here. Uh, what we're forging with is the depth, uh, and those corners, what they do is they end up um, galling our work, and we don't want that. We don't want to introduce any marks uh, or the potential for something that could cause a crack uh, in our tenon. Um, once we've done that, we want to file in the flare. And I put a sample here to show what I'm talking about with that flare. So this side of the tool creates the shoulder of the tenon. Uh, this, this middle part creates uh, the sort of the root of the tenon here. And the, what the flare does is that helps us isolate that material here. So um, it doesn't matter too much how big or little your flare is, so long as it uh, you're, you're ending up with a sort of nice uh, uh, mass on the end that you'll then um, draw out in your secondary tool. 
Uh, and at this point, we relieve all the edges. We don't want anything sharp to cut into, um, uh, particularly the shoulder and the root of the tenon that could cause cracks, but we do want to file the edges, any, any sharp edges off of the entire tool. Uh, and again, we're doing this for both sides and so that they match. Okay, and so this is what we should end up, up, end up with. Uh, we have um, these two dies, and um, here I'm just showing a sample of um, how it works. Um, and this is why we use this tool. It creates a beautiful tenon um, uh, for this project. Okay, so the top bottom swage, it's very similar. So I'll just go over this briefly. So we taper the end. Uh, we use a triangular file to uh, start that cut in the middle. Then we switch to a round file and then we relieve the corners and the edges. Uh, and then we should have a set of matched dies here. Um, and this is what it does is it draws out that isolated mass and um, uh, gives us the tenon that we're looking for. Okay, so um, one thing that's very important is the relationship between the, the, um, the sizes of the openings. So uh, what we're aiming for here is a quarter of an inch tenon uh, when we're done. And um, we want, uh, the opening of our first tool to be just fractionally larger than the opening of our second tool. Uh, and the reason for this is that um, if the first tool is uh, smaller than the second one, we're left with a little bit of a waste at the sort of the root of the tenon um, and our tenon won't function as well. For this particular project, um, because we're cutting off the tenon, it's not such a big deal, but we do wanna make our tools so that they function. Um, and then we see here a tool that we haven't gotten to yet. This is a heading block that's used to match our backing plate um, so that we can work with um, our staple while we make it square. Um, and we need our tenons to fit into those holes. So whatever size uh, this is, is the size of our tenons. But since we know that uh, metal expands uh, when it's hot, we need this um, and our backing plate to be fractionally larger than uh, the, the tenon. Uh, so in this case, I made uh, this tool to be a quarter of an inch, uh, and then I drilled using the next size up drill bit. So it was, I think, 1764 to make this hole. Um, and that allowed uh, space for that uh, tenon to fit in there. Um, our last step here is to test our tool before we case harden it to make sure that we don't have any marks uh, and that it's uh, on our work when we're using it and also that it's working as we intended. Um, okay, so then we case harden the business end. So um, if you've done level one, you should have case hardened um, at least your monkey tool, so you should be somewhat familiar with this. Um, so I'll just uh, go through this. Um, so uh, tips, wear a mask, you shouldn't break this. We all have masks from the pandemic um, and use a, uh, some sort of tray to catch the excess compound. Here's just an aluminum tray I grabbed out of the kitchen. Um, I'm using Cherry Red. Um, there's some different brands out there of case hardening compound. Uh, use what you like. Uh, to use it, we want to heat up the part that we're trying to uh, case harden. So in this case, the business end of our dies. Uh, heat them up to cherry red. Uh, and this really is cherry red. We don't want it to be orange. We don't want it to be yellow. We want it to be cherry red. Uh, then uh, sprinkle on the case hardening compound. And what you should see is that it's melting and bubbling like you see in this photo. Um, then we stick it back into the forge, uh, reheat to cherry red, and then immediately quench, swish it around. Uh, we want to break up that steam jacket that fours, uh, for, um, sorry, forms in our steam bucket. You should hear a pop. I don't always hear a pop, but you should hear a pop. Uh, that's a pretty good indication that it worked. Um, then we take it back out. Um, there might be a little bit of compound stuck to it still, you can take it off, but what you should see is something that is no scale on it at all. It should be completely clean surface. Um, and you'll see a kind of modeling of color. So um, as you see here, sort of um, some metal that's silver and some that's black. Um, um, and that's a pretty good indication that this process worked. Uh, you can check it with a file. Um, one thing that's 
kind of neat about case hardening is essentially what it's doing in a, a coating on the outside that's carbon. So it's a little bit harder. I think of it kind of like an M&M, so it's soft on the middle, um, but you have this candy coating on the outside that's hard. Um, and you can kind of uh, thicken that coating by doing this process multiple times. So say up to three times, um, you can add a little bit more carbon. Um, and this really allows us to use mild steel uh, and um, use these tools for um, you know, a good long time. All right, so that's the tools to do the tenons. Um, let's look at the tools that we need to create the squared bend. Uh, so uh, Victoria just showed us how to bend the, that staple over uh, the, uh, the horn of the anvil. We're gonna take that same approach here and then use tools to make that bend square. Uh, so we need three tools for this. Uh, the first is, um, kind of a, a, a heading block. Uh, this will also serve as our monkey tool. Uh, we, don't, we won't use a monkey tool in this. Um, and then um, what that does is uh, protect our tenons while we uh, square up that bend. Then we have a, a, a top swage here that we'll use to squish that bend down. Um, and you can see that as it squishes, it doesn't get entirely square. So then we have a mandrel uh, that we then use um, uh, to get those uh, bends square. All right, so look, let's look at creating these tools. Um, uh, there's nothing too complicated about creating these. Um, the first is this heading block. Um, again, this is used to protect those tenons while we're um, uh, squishing that bend at the top. So uh, an important consideration is that this is uh, higher or taller than our tenons. So our tenons are uh, a quarter inch in length. So we need this to be say half an inch um, uh, in height. Um, and then we have this other bit here, which is basically a, a bottom swage uh, that we use when we use our mandrel to protect our legs from uh, getting squished by the anvil. Um, so uh, we need that to uh, be a, uh, at least an inch, an inch and a quarter uh, for it to function. Uh, again, uh, you know, what you use is kind of up to you and what you have in your shop. Uh, there's some flexibility here. Um, and this tool matches our backing plate. This is our backing plate here. So we're drilling the holes uh, to what we'll, um, we'll do in the backing plate uh, so that we're maintaining uh, the, this tenon staple uh, in the dimensions that we want it to be. Um, the way to make this is by driving in a piece of three eighths of an inch bar uh, um, while the, the stock is hot. Um, this is obviously a stage photo. I would do this uh, before I drilled the holes um, um, and then drill the holes. Uh, if you are um, already into level two or if you're an instructor, you can uh, make this as a hardy block instead. Uh, that gives it a little bit more stability. Um, however, the um, using an inch, uh, inch and a quarter by a half inch worked uh, uh, totally fine for what we're using it for. Uh, be sure to chamfer the edges and uh, round all the corners uh, and countersink those, um, those drilled holes so that you don't have anything that's sharp that's cutting into that nice staple that we're making. Okay. Our next tool is the handheld 3 eighths of an inch top swage. If this looks familiar, it's because it is. We just made this uh, for the dies for our guillotine tool. The only difference is that, is that we're filing in a 3, and three eighths of an inch uh, 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 swage instead of a quarter of an inch. Uh, so we just need a bigger file for that. Um, and the way that we use this is that um, we uh, push down um, on that rounded bend into our uh, heading block uh, to um, create, start to create that square uh, corner that we want for our staple. Okay, our next tool is a mandrel to upset those corners. Um, and um, this is a three quarters of an inch by inch stock uh, that meets the interior dimension of um, uh, the, what we're given in the drawing. Uh, and then uh, the corners are heavily rounded so that there's nothing sharp cutting into our uh, staple. And then it's welded onto um, square bar uh, 
there's a twist here on purpose uh, that allows for us to weld here and then hold it with a pair of V-bit uh, tongs at the other end. Um, if you're not a welder, you don't have access to a welder, you could uh, just use a longer piece of three quarters of an inch by one inch bar. Okay, so those are all the tools and now we're ready to forge the staple. Uh, and we'll be back into familiar territory now. Uh, first step, calculate the starting stock. There's nothing complicated here. Uh, this is the drawing that's on the website. Uh, there are some slightly different drawings floating around out there. Um, as an instructor, I don't really care which uh, dimensions you use, so long as you're forging to the dimension uh, you said that you are forging to. Um, so uh, if you're using a different drawing, do the calculation for that. Um, so uh, we're given one and a half inches for uh, this leg. Uh, as Victoria mentioned, we measure down the center line, which means to figure out that uh, neutral uh, uh, dimension, we need to subtract half the height of the bar to give us one and five sixteenths of an inch uh, for each of these two legs. Uh, for the top, this is also one and a half inches. So for that, we want to subtract uh, three sixteenths on this side, three sixteenths on that side, and that gives us a top of one and an eighth inches. Uh, then we need to upset the bar. And the reason we're upsetting the bar is that when we create tenons, uh, the act of butchering in the shoulder pulls some of the material from the leg into the, the, the shoulder tenon area. Uh, and so it gets skinnier as it goes into there. Uh, and we don't want that to happen. So we compensate for that by upsetting uh, this area right here. Uh, it doesn't need to be a big upset. Um, this drawing is exaggerated. Um, uh, so um, we're adding in an eighth of an inch uh, on each side to uh, allow for that upset. Uh, then we have the tenon and we need to calculate how much material we need to create the tenon. Uh, the drawing shows us that we're, um, uh, that we're aiming for a quarter of an inch tenon, that's a quarter of an inch long. Um, well, in order to uh, start a tenon, uh, we need to come back half the height of the bar, no matter what. And the reason for that is that if you come back less than that, uh, it starts to peel, the material at the end starts to peel, essentially it fish lips, and you won't be able to create a uh, tenon um, out of that kind of folded material. Um, so if we come back half the height of the bar, uh, that uh, prevents that from happening. We know that our bar uh, started out at 3 eighths of an inch, so we need to come back 3 sixteenths of an inch anyways. Uh, we also upset that bar, uh, so we want to add a little bit more. So we want to come back about a quarter of an inch uh, on each side for the tenon, and that will give us more than sufficient material to um, create the tenon that we need. In fact, we'll get a tenon that's closer to um, almost 3 quarters of an inch. Uh, so adding that all up, I won't go through the numbers again, but we get four and a half inches. All right, so our next step is to forge the tenons on each end of the staple. Uh, so here we have our four and a half inch long uh, starting stock. Uh, here we're upsetting the bar on each end. Um, and I'll, I'll just say now, just like Victoria, I'll show you a, a video of this at the end, but we'll go through it in photos first. Um, and let's just look at this upset. So you can see uh, that this upset um, is in the area where the shoulder uh, will go. So about a quarter of an inch uh, in. Uh, and that's where we want it. We want it right here where that shoulder will go. Uh, you can also see that um, this bar is about a quarter of an inch shorter than our starting stock. Uh, so we, we did actually upset about an eighth of an inch on each side. Uh, then we come in and using our tools, um, uh, start the, the shoulder, isolate the material, draw it out. Uh, and as you can see, we have uh, plenty of material here and then cut it off to about a quarter of an inch that we need for the tenon staple. Uh, so let's look at uh, this uh, step by step. Uh, so upset the bar at each end. Um, take care to get the heat right. Uh, this is um, an area where I see students go uh, awry. Um, and that's um, because they really struggle with getting the heat right. Um, so um, for the purpose of our upset, we need that upset to be where that shoulder will be. 
Um, so our first step is to strategically quench. Um, and we want about a little bit more than half an inch. Uh, if you're working with solid fuel, you might uh, be able to get away with not quenching. If you're working with propane, you definitely need to quench. Um, here we can see that the heat is too short. So um, we're getting an upset at the end. You can see that there, but we're not really getting an upset here where we want it. Uh, in this photo, you can see that we we have the heat just right. And you can see that we're getting an upset right here where that shoulder will go. And this is what we're aiming for. Um, here on the this photo, uh, and this is a little bit exaggerated, um, uh, we're bending the bar. Uh, we are getting an upset and we're getting it in the right place, but we're bending the bar. Uh, so our heat is too long. Um, and there's actually a rule of thumb for this, which is whatever you're upsetting, um, isolate the heat to about one and a half times the thickness of the bar. So our bar is three eighths of an inch and three eighths of an inch times one and a half is just a little bit more than a half an inch. Well, look, that's where the heat is just right. Uh, once you get longer than that, uh, and especially if you get longer than three times the thickness of whatever you're working with, you're just bending the bar. You're not upsetting. Uh, so if you're finding you're bending the bar too much, um, uh, shorten your heat. If you're finding you're not getting enough of an upset, um, lengthen your heat and play with this. Um, okay. So once we have our upset, we use our butcher dies to create the shoulder and isolate the mass for the tenon. And as you can see in this photo, this is why we're using these tools. This gives an absolutely outstanding uh, shoulder and root of the tenon. Um, this is what we want. And this is why the, um, we bother to make these tools. Um, and just a pitch for making these tools. Um, we, we need them for, we need some sort of guillotine tool for the level two and level three. So you might as well get started now. Um, okay, so then we use the top and bottom swage to draw out the tenon. And again, uh, this is what we're looking for. And again, that's, that's a perfect uh, tenon. Okay, so we're going to cut our tenons to length. It's a quarter of an inch on each end. And um, I'm going to throw in some options here. Um, so um, if you do not have access to a welder uh, and uh, the creating um, the, the guillotine tool would be a hurdle for you passing level one. Um, this is my opinion, Mark and Victoria might have a different idea, but I don't really care how you make the tenon so long as you make a tenon somehow and attach it to the backing plate and do a good job. Um, so one option is to file the tenon, uh, and you can see here, um, and um, uh, this is a kind of meticulous process, but you work square, octagon, round, just like you do with forging. Uh, you want to use a bastard file with one safe edge, uh, carefully measure out what size uh, your tenon should be, and then I've used Sharpie here to mark out what I want to file off. Uh, the safe edge is so that we can file down without taking material out of the, the center where we want it. Uh, once we get to square, we take off the corners and make an octagon and then take that octagon to round. Um, and that makes a lovely tenon and you only need two of these. Um, okay, the other option is using the uh, level one tools um, uh, tools at the anvil. So here we see the fuller and the z-bar that we create in level one. Um, depending on when you've done level one, you might have created a butcher if you did it before the curriculum changed, a handheld butcher. Uh, either one works. Um, the problem with using these with round bars, is it ends up distorting the area that will become the shoulder. Uh, so one way to solve that is to forge the end square. Um, and then uh, go through the whole process of upsetting and then using our tools to create the tenon. Uh, so here I'm showing uh, using the tools at the anvil. Um, the, um, uh, once you get your tenon, uh, it's also drawing it out at the anvil. Um, and you know these tools give you enough space. This is a 3 eighths of an inch uh, diameter fuller and z-bar here, it gives you enough space that you can actually get, uh, with some very careful hammering, um, get to um, 
to draw your tenon at the anvil. Uh, and then you need to use your monkey tool to monkey that back and you actually get a pretty nice result. So um, I think that looks great. I think it would look great on the gate latch. Okay, uh, so our next step is to bend the staple to a square D shape. Um, so instead of trying to bend it square first, we, we bend it over the horn, we squish it down and then we use our mandrel to make it square. So let's look at how we do that. Um, Okay, so our first step is to mark the center. Uh, we can use our tool to hold that in place while we do that. Uh, start the bend over the horn, just like we did the other staple. Uh, you can finish the bend at the horn or at the anvil. And at this point, what we're trying to do is to get it to fit into that heading plate. Um, we want to fit the bend into the holes. This can be a little bit tricky if you didn't nail it, uh, when you did the bend. Um, this is where tongs come in handy and rivet tongs in particular are handy for this uh, because you can uh, squish both legs evenly at the same time to get it to move just a little bit or you can put the tongs inside and kind of pull them to open it up just a little bit and that's a really useful um, uh, set of tongs there. Um, there are some other tongs that might work for that, but the rivet tongs are the only ones that I've found anyways that fit on the inside. Uh, once you get it to fit into your uh, backing plate there, um, quench the legs. You want to quench them about a third and then um, use your top switch to flatten the bend at the top. Um, and then once you've flattened the bend, use your mandrel to square the, the staple. Um, and I've shown showing two pictures here. Um, this uh, first one is how we should use this tool, which is keeping that upset area off the tool so we don't distort it uh, as we forge. Um, and here it's showing that it's um, that upset that we made is in the tool. And so when we hit on the top, it will distort that upset, uh, which we don't want to happen. Okay, so let's watch a video of this. Um, and what we see here, so we're upsetting. This is not a big upset. Uh, maybe six blows there. If you do get a bend, take the bend out behind the upset so that you're not taking out the upset, uh, like you see here. Uh, and keep in mind, this is not a huge upset. The, the drawing is very exaggerated. We just need enough of an upset so that um, when we create the tenon, we're, we're not, um, we have enough material to um, at the end of the bar there. So using this tool, uh, we want to start the blows and then turn our um, stock 90 degrees with each turn um, until basically our dies meet. Um, and the reason we're doing this is so that we get an even forging all the way around. Uh, and this is what it should look like at this point. Um, and these tools make this quick work. Uh, this is why we make these tools. Uh, same thing with this, uh, put it into your dies turn it 90 degrees, uh, basically until your dies meet and you've drawn out your tenon. And that's what it should look like. Uh, at this point, center punch the middle, you cut your tenons off to a quarter of an inch, uh, and then we um, uh, uh, bend it over the horn, turn it around, bend the other side, try to keep that center punch mark in the middle. Uh, here we're taking another heat, um, and we're trying to get the legs so that they fit into our block. Uh, then we're using our top swage to uh, squish that bend down. Uh, we start in the middle, then we move it to each side uh, to um, try to evenly uh, uh, flatten that bend. Uh, you can see here that one side is just slightly higher than the other side. So we want to go back and use our top tool again uh, to try to even that before we use the mandrel. Uh, so that's what we're seeing here. Um, at this point, we take our mandrel. Uh, we set this into our tool. Remember to keep the upset part of our, um, our bar off of the tool. Um, and then we're not forging, we're just uh, flattening that curve uh, until 
it fits the mandrel. And notice here that we're hitting not straight down, but on each side. We're not, we don't want to flatten the stock. Uh, we want, uh, we want to just uh, bend it into the right uh, shape. Okay, so that is our staple. And you can see here that it, it doesn't quite fit back into the, the block. And that's okay, uh, because we're going to make our uh, backing plate next. Uh, and we can drill the holes to match uh, what we have here. Um, if we came back and tried to squish it back into the, 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 uh, our drilled holes, um, the, the top won't quite look right. So we don't wanna mess with it. It looks right, it is right. Okay, our next step is to forge or fabricate the backing plate. Uh, you can absolutely fabricate the backing plate. Um, uh, you can use uh, eighth of an inch by one and a half inch uh, uh, steel um, and cut it to size and drill the holes and be done. It is, however, more fun to forge it, so that's what I'm going to go through here. Uh, so our starting stock for this is one inch by a quarter of an inch, uh, and what we'll do is we'll peen it out until we get it to an eighth of an inch by one and a half inches. Uh, well, wait a minute, you might say, if you um, took one inch by a quarter of an inch uh, and cut it in half, uh, you would have two inches by an eighth of an inch. Uh, but you're telling me that we're going to peen it out to an inch and a half by an eighth of an inch. And yes, that's correct. So when we spread material, uh, we don't actually get as much spread as would mathematically make sense. Uh, and the reason for that is when we're peening, our cross peen goes to both sides, but it also elongates the material. Um, and there's a formula for that, which is that you get about 40, I'm sorry, 75% of the spread that you think that you're going to get. So uh, that works out very nicely. So our, um, our one inch bar that we think should be able to peen out to two inches if we take 75% of that two inches, it works out uh, to one and a half inches, which is perfect. Uh, to do this, we want to uh, create a trough in the middle uh, by peening right down the middle uh, and uh, getting that all the way to that eighth of an inch thickness. It's important to get that material out of the middle now uh, because it's difficult uh, once you start spreading uh, to get that material out of the middle. Uh, then once we've created that trough, we spread the material to our weaker side. Okay, what do I mean by our weaker side? So it's the side away from your hammer hand. Um, that's the side that's harder for us to forge. Um, and the reason we do this first is that we then come to our stronger side and pee in the other direction, matching what we did with our weaker side. If we did it the other way, our stronger side first and then our weaker side, it's more difficult for us to match what we forged. And although I show this in two steps, this is really a process of going back and forth on the two sides until you get the desired um, uh, spread. Uh, then we cut it off, drill the holes, and we have a lovely backing plate. So let's look at this in uh, photos. So here uh, we're creating a trough in the center. Uh, then we're spreading to uh, our weak side uh, and then we're matching that on our strong side. Okay, so let's watch a video of this. Okay, so we're going right down the middle with our cross peen, uh, getting that all the way to an eighth of an inch thickness. And that's what we're looking for there. And then we'll spread it away from us first. And I apologize for my video. My camera is shaking when I hit the anvil. Uh, I don't have the best setup in my forge, uh, but we're, we're spreading out away from us first. Uh, and this is actually a really great uh, exercise to uh, practice your hammer control and also to see uh, if there's anything in your hammer blow that needs correcting, uh, because the metal doesn't lie. Uh, and if you're holding your hammer uh, at an angle, uh, you're favoring one side, it will show up in this process. Um, so this is a really great exercise uh, to um, look at your hammer blow. 
Uh, so now we're peening back towards the strong side, so towards your hammer hand, and we're matching uh, what we did on the first side. And again, uh, this video is a little bit truncated. Um, so we're going back and forth between the two sides until we get the desired spread and thickness that we want. So it's not all one side and then all the other side, as I'm showing here. Um, and so now we have um, our one and a half inches and uh, by three inches, and we can cut this uh, um, off and uh, drill the holes to create our backing plate. Okay, so at this point, we can punch or drill holes in our backing plate. And although this is a test for level one, and we made punches in level one, so um, you might be all gung ho to punch your holes, I'm going to suggest you drill your holes. Uh, and the reason for that is that this is eighth of an inch stock and eighth of an inch uh, cools down very quickly and it will do a number on your punch. Uh, you can of course punch your holes. Uh, there's no problem if you do that, just be aware that um, you'll probably need to uh, uh, um, take care of your punch at the end of that. Um, so in terms of the holes, um, again, this is on the website, but we're drilling our holes one and an eighth inches apart. That's to match that diameter of um, that, um, that center line of where the tenons will go through here uh, from our staple. And it says here a quarter of an inch holes, but uh, remember that our tenons are a quarter of an inch. So we want to drill our holes uh, just slightly larger uh, than our tenon. Uh, be sure to countersink both sides. Uh, we're aiming here for a flush tenon, so we definitely want to countersink sink the side that will have uh, our tenon that we're hitting the tenon on, but we also want to countersink the other side because we have a little bit of a radius at the root of our tenon and we want to accommodate that. Okay, so our next step is to head the tenons. Um, and um, we're given a quarter of an inch in the dimensions for our drawing, um, which actually works out pretty well for this, um, but it's good to understand uh, how long your tenon should be um, for a flush tenon. Um, so what I'm showing in this picture here is that this one looks a little bit long, and it is. Uh, so the calculation for, um, for a flush tenon, a tenon that's flat, uh, is what we're going through. So here our eighth of an inch plate, plus about, and again, this depends a little bit on how big your countersink is, um, um, about 0.7 times the diameter of our tenon uh, for this to work out. So this one is actually a little bit long and I probably cut it too long. Uh, these look better here. Um, use jaw protectors in your vise uh, with well-rounded edges. Uh, when we uh, head the tenons, uh, uh, the, this whole um, assembly will slide into a little, the, the vise a little bit, and we don't want to scratch that nice uh, staple that we just made. Uh, we need to apply heat. Um, the best way to apply heat for a tenon is oxyacetylene. Uh, if you don't have oxyacetylene, another option is to use MAP gas, a MAP gas torch. Uh, the pro uh, propane torches don't get hot enough, but the MAP gas works up to about 5 16th of an inch tenon, so it will work well for this quarter inch tenon. Um, you could probably also um, head these cold, although I actually didn't try it for this project. I have done it for other projects. Uh, and sort of the last resort is to stick it in the forge to heat it up. Okay, so this is our final result. Um, we've got a, a nicely headed tenon here. Um, this is not exactly flush. If um, with the, the, the 0.7, uh, times the diameter of the tenon, you will get a slight, um, about a 16th of an inch um, sort of dome on top of here. It's not a big dome. Uh, for the application uh, that we're using this for, which is to um, uh, screw this into a post, uh, you don't actually need to file this off. Uh, wood is pretty accommodating, uh, but you can absolutely file this off if you want to make it flush. Uh, as an instructor, I'd kind of like to see the tenon so I can see how you did on heading it and see if it has any cracks. 
Um, but again, you're absolutely fine if you want to file that flush. Uh, and then what I'm showing here is that we have a nice joint. Uh, the um, the shoulder uh, is nice and clean, and it, there's no gaps going into that backing plate. Uh, so let's watch a video of heading that tenon. Okay, so again, uh, use a vice jaw uh, protectors there that are well rounded. Uh, be sure to put your backing plate on the correct direction. Um, so the the, uh, the the peened part is on the other side. Again, you can also um, fabricate a tent, uh, fabricate instead of forging your backing plate. Uh, apply some heat and then using a uh, ball peen hammer uh, to head these. Um, you want to kind of uh, uh, hammer straight down at first and then go around the edges. Uh, and then you have the option of filing this flush if you want. And then we'll turn this over and we can see the finished product. So this is what we're aiming for here. Okay. So now it's your turn. Do this again at the spring conference, if anybody's coming to the spring conference. Um, certainly we've we've ignored this gate latch for a long time. Uh, it's you know walking around the elephant in the room, and we've just decided this last year that we were going to tackle it. Uh, and so we've done that. Uh, Becky, Victoria and I did it as a, a training in Los Angeles at Adams Forge. Victoria and I just did a training in Weaverville. Uh, we've done it at, uh, again, the three of us did it at uh, Winterbash and we're going to do it again at Spring Conference. So uh, you'll see this again. We really want to put some effort in. It's been a stumbling block uh, in our curriculum for a while and we're trying to smooth the road out. Um, thank you very much to Victoria and Becky. They did an excellent job, as per usual. Um, and uh, we will see. So the three of us are working at the Spring Conference. If you're at the Spring Conference, we'll see you there. Um, we are hopefully going to be working at the Banner Conference in 2024, uh, staffing their um, education tent, and that is in Johnstown, Pennsylvania. Um, and we will be doing the same sort of things there. Again, you'll see a large push for this uh, level one. I think we're doing about an 18 month push. Uh, a banner is you know, taking this all the way through. Um, so uh, and feel free to contact us. Uh, if you have a question, you know, reach out certainly to me by email. I'll do the best I can to uh, give you an answer. And if I don't have an answer, I'll tell you. Um, 